Hello, everybody. My name is Bella Lopez, and I'm a fourth year student here at Cal, double majoring in history and media studies. Um, I have loved my Cal experience. I am in the rally committee, as you can tell by my shirt. Um, and I've had such a great time finding a community here and being able to put on events like the homecoming rally tonight. It's it though, you should stop by, it's at seven. Um, and then just walking down Sproul this morning, it's so clear that everyone here is so passionate about something, whether it's their you know, academic studies, their community, um, or any other activities that they do. And so I'd like to thank our donors for their generous support. Cal all benefits from the support of generations of donors. And so thank you all so much. And of course, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Michael Silver, a professor of optometry and vision science and neuroscience. Michael Silver is the faculty director of Berkeley Center for Science and Psychedelics, or the BCSP. His lab works to better understand how the brain actively constructs representations of the visual environment. Although Michael's team has been conducting pharmacological studies in humans for 18 years, his BCSP research is his first foray into psychedelic work. Following decades of suppression of research on psychedelics in human subjects, Michael is thrilled to have the opportunity to employ psychedelics in studies that will shine new light on mysteries of the mind and brain. Go Bears, and please welcome Professor Silver. Thank you so much, Bella, for the introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming today. It's really lovely to see you. It's an honor to be, to be part of Cal's homecoming activities. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, land acknowledgement. Before we begin this event, we take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So the subject of the lecture today is uh, kind of an overview of a relatively new center on our campus, the UC Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics. We just celebrated our third birthday. And uh, I'm the uh, faculty director of the center, but there are many, many people who are involved in, in various aspects of this work, and you'll, you'll, hear a lot of, from a, you'll hear about a lot of them today. So from its origins, the BCSP has had three major areas of focus. This includes research, that's research with both human subjects and experimental animal models. Training, which means programs for preparing people to be facilitators of other psychedelic experiences and public education, which includes journalism um, as well as other educational activities. And a founding principle of our center is that it's extremely interdisciplinary. It spans many different departments and schools on our campus and many different fields. Uh, every center on our campus has a administrative home where it lives in, in the overall kind of UC Berkeley landscape. Ours is the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. Uh, but the members of our center come from all of these different uh, departments and schools listed here, psychology, molecular cell biology, education, journalism, optometry, public health and neuroscience, and really this is just the beginning for us. We, we would like to expand further into the humanities and social sciences uh, as the center continues to grow. So why do we need a center like this? What's, what's uh, interesting about psychedelics research? How does it impact society or health or human well-being? So many of you, I'm sure, have seen reports in the media of clinical trials of psychedelic-assisted therapy for a variety of mental health disorders. Uh, here's one uh, result from a study of MDMA, which is uh, the chemical name for ecstasy or molly, 
So pairing MDMA with psychotherapy for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And this graph shows a uh, scale that quantifies the severity of PTSD symptoms. And the x-axis here are different uh, sessions. So where the, the uh, severity of the PTSD was assessed after different time points in this MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And so a reduction in these values means an improvement in the severity of PTSD. And blue is, is the placebo condition. The red is the pairing of the drug with psychotherapy. Uh, and you can see there's a reduction in severity in both cases over time, but that the reduction is much more pronounced when MDMA-assisted psych psychotherapy uh, um, is administered. And the number of mental health disorders for which psychedelic-assisted therapy seems to have promise is very broad. It includes PTSD, but also anxiety, depression, substance use disorder, and many others. So this is fascinating and significant mental health challenges in the US and around the world and very limited treatment options for many people. And so the idea that there is a new treatment that has the potential to help uh, improve the mental health of people is very exciting, but it needs to be said that we really have almost no idea about how this is effective at the level of the brain. How is it actually working is something that much more research needs to be done. And so our center is interested in understanding the actions of psychedelics in the brain, in part to be able to understand how these therapies work and then ultimately to develop more effective therapies over time. Psychedelics are also a very reliable way of enhancing neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity simply means the capacity of the brain to change. And so neuroplasticity includes learning. When we learn new skills or knowledge or experiences, that's a type of neuroplasticity. Recovery from brain injury is a type of plasticity. There's also plasticity uh, that is, can be maladaptive as well. And so having a set of chemicals that specifically enhance neuroplasticity is also something that's very interesting from a research perspective uh, with potentially many applications once we have a better understanding of the mechanisms. There's also some really fascinating findings from studies of psychedelics, uh, in, not in clinical populations, but in so-called neurotypical participants who don't have a mental health diagnosis. And in this case, this paper uh, surveyed people after a psychedelic experience that uh, they had in the context of a research study. And they asked them about the significance of that experience in the context of other significant experiences in their life. And for many people, the psychedelic experience was profound and significant at a level that was similar to the most significant experiences they've ever had. So there's the birth of a child or the death of a parent. Um, and so that's pretty fascinating too. How can a chemical administered in the appropriate context reliably elicit these transcendent experiences that are so powerful for people? And what does that tell us about the nature of human experience and, and its associated brain mechanisms? And then finally, for basic neuroscientists and psychologists who are interested in characterizing the properties of the mind and brain, having a tool that can reliably alter perception, cognition, emotion uh, is a, a really uh, appealing way of studying the basic mechanisms of all of these phenomena. So if you have a complex brain and you have a drug that and uh, drug interaction with the in, interacting with the environment that uh, changes some aspect of cognition or uh, emotion or brain activity, uh, then that can be used to give you basic insights into the fundamental mechanisms. And so we're really excited about psychedelics as a research tool in that context as well. So uh, hopefully one of those points kind of convinced you that psychedelics are a pretty fascinating group of molecules and deserve much, uh, much deeper study. And as many of you know, research on psychedelics, uh, in, especially in human subjects, has been very minimal decades and just very recently. So, you know, initially uh, we a lot has been seen about the properties of various psychedelics, both plants and fungi and even animals by indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples have learned a great deal about the effects of different kinds of plants and um, fungi and animals that, that we now know have psychedelic molecules as part of them. Um, they've also learned a great deal about how to use these molecules or these uh, organisms in ceremonial context to promote different kinds of healing. And so this kind of research is uh, not always considered to be research from a Western science framework, but certainly a great deal of knowledge that has uh, come about through the indigenous uh, use of these uh, various materials. Uh, and this goes back to these and even millennia cases. In a Western science framework, 
the identification of particular psychedelic molecules uh, was a real uh, landmark. Uh, so you see in 1938, LSD was the first time. This is not a molecule, it's a natural product, a synthetic molecule, but also extraction of psychedelic compounds from plants, in this case, mescaline from the San Pedro cactus or the peyote cactus, psilocybin from psychedelic mushroom. Uh, these all give insights into the chemical basis of why these mushrooms and these plants have psychedelic activities. And then people begin to appreciate that psychedelics, especially in the context of psychotherapy, can have complications and could be useful for treating mental health. And so many hundreds of papers, actually, from the 1950s to 1960s, conducted research, and a lot of these were uh, either psychiatrists or psychologists, uh, studying the possibility that psychedelics could be useful for mental health treatment. And many of these papers would not be modern standards of rigor for clinical trials, but still there were a lot of intriguing, I would say, preliminary results about uh, the possibility of psychedelic mental health treatments. Um, and so initially, these were very much some research chemicals that were being studied in the context of uh, healthcare. Um, but then, although in the 1960s, they became much more available to the general public, and people started using them for all kinds of reasons to go to parties, uh, listen to music, and to go to the woods in ceremonial contexts. Uh, and they became extremely prevalent uh, in the United States and, and other countries as well. Uh, and this elicited a backlash. Many were threatened by the possibility that psychedelics were going to have negative effects on our society. They were Stabilize society. There are also concerns about safety, people using them in uncontrolled ways without knowledge and preparation sometimes. Um, there, were also, there was also misinformation about some of the risks, although there are also real risks. And so a combination of all of the reactions to psychedelics being so widely used led to the Controlled Substances Act being passed in the early 1970s, after Richard Nixon signing the act. And so this set up this schedule system that many of you have heard about, controlled substances are classified in different schedules. Uh, and so Controlled Substances Act created uh, Schedule 1, LSD and psilocybin were both placed in Schedule 1. And some of the criteria for Schedule 1 are listed here. So they, uh, to be in Schedule 1, a drug is formally uh, not have, not does not have any currently accepted medical use, and also it's a high potential for abuse. And so that is the designation that the drugs are still in today, despite the research that's ongoing for these compounds. And so, the drugs were not made illegal for research purposes necessarily, but the difficulty of doing research, given the, all the restrictions on controlled substances, uh, essentially meant that there was very little research with human subjects uh, for decades afterwards. That started to change in the 1990s. Uh, initially, with MT dimethyltryptamine is a, also a controlled substance, but is also a neurotransmitter that we all make in our bodies as well. Uh, and Rich Drossman and his team wanted to obtain all the regulatory tools necessary to do research on human subjects with a psychedelic drug, and it's DMT. And then that's sort of opened the door and provided a roadmap for how other institutions could do this sort of work. And so that's led to now with many, many FDA approved clinical trials of drugs like MDMA, psilocybin, uh, being used to treat a variety of different disorders. And there's a lot of uh, corporate interest now as well. Companies are sponsoring. Um, these trials, very similar to the way that pharmaceutical companies develop new drugs for treating blood pressure, for example, or arthritis. Uh, so the FDA is regulating all of these and has the same standard. We're testing the efficacy of the safety and efficacy of these drugs for in different uh, medical contexts. There's also a lot of difference in the connection between psychedelic and spiritual experience. So there's research that's going on there that's not necessarily in a medical context, exploring aspect of the psychedelic experience. And as I mentioned before, psychedelics are basic research tools to better understand the fundamental properties of the mind and brain, which at the moment we have such little understanding of as a field. So that's the context of psychedelics research. There's, there's really been a resurgence in this research, um, and that was part of the way that the BCSP, the, the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics, is working to be able to uh, bring psychedelic research to Berkeley. So our focus is not on testing these drugs in the context of treatment of mental health disorders. We're doing basic mechanistic research, which we hope will inform treatment development. But uh, our initial focus in the human subjects uh, is really to understand the fundamental properties of the mind, brain, and body, and use psychedelics as a way of, of better, of deepening up of that. 
so we have a set of experiments that are really characterizing the psychedelic experience itself, and this involves brain imaging, perception, and cognition. So we're, we're using a dose that's low enough that can realistically and, and ethically uh, participate in experiments uh, and, and have measurements made of the brain and of the perception and cognition during the psychedelic experience, the psilocybin. Other studies have higher doses, but really the experience is very stringent and intense. We're not really studying people during the experience, rather, we're comparing them after the experience. Look at the enduring formative effects of that psychedelic experience on emotion, learning and memory, and stress regulation. Uh, and then also we have experiments in animal models, rodents, to examine at a cellular and molecular synaptic level exactly how do psychedelics enhance neuroplasticity in the brain. So I'll tell you a little bit about this first uh, set of experiments characterizing the psychedelic experience itself, and it's based on this framework called predictive code, the theory of perception, which is that the brain is constantly generating an internal model of the environment, and it's making kind of guesses or predictions about what's coming next. And so this doesn't feel like we perceive the world, right? We perceive the world, we, we, it feels like we perceive the world as the way a camera does. We just move our eyes around, and we just record what's out there. But perception is, is really a very active, constructive process. It's built by the brain, and obviously it's informed by information from in the environment, but it's also informed by all the previous experience we've had. And the brain can do a lot of uh, saving of computation by taking advantage of knowledge about patterns and regularities in the world to be able to make educated guesses about what's going to happen next. And so that's this process of predictive coding. And the brain's constantly generating these predictions about what will happen next in the visual environment and then comparing them to the information that it gets from the eyes. And these predictions are informed by our experiences about the, the ways that objects and uh, images um, behave in the world. And so these are called priors, based prior that we bring to each moment of perception to be able to generate these predictions. So here's an example of how priors uh, influence perception. Uh, you, See these two images, the one on the left looks like mounds, or, I'm sorry, looks like craters on top of mounds. The one on the right looks like mounds at the bottom of craters. These are actually exactly the same image. Each one is just flipped compared to the other. So the image itself is fundamentally ambiguous. There, there is no right answer, so to speak, about three-dimensional content of this image based on the image itself. So it could be concave, it could be convex at any given point, and, and there's, there's not enough information in the image to, to actually determine that. But we don't experience it as ambiguous. We experience it in one very particular interpretation. And that's thought to be because our prior in this case is the light is probably coming from above. The light that's illuminating these objects is coming from above as opposed to coming from below. And as soon as you make that assumption, then the pattern of shading in the image does disambiguate it. And it is then either craters and mounds or mounds and craters. So we're not aware of this assumption that our brain is making. And the assumption that light comes from above instead of below is a very solid assumption for almost all the environments we encounter, but we've all experienced visual illusions where we, are, we fail to see things as they actually are. And this is usually an example of setting up the illusion, illusory stimulus in a way that it sort of takes it, it, it it's just the exception that proves the rule really. It shows how predictive coding in particular situations, the, the assumptions that we make are incorrect. And so we have these illusory experiences. In this case, the uh, prediction that light is coming from above is helpful because it gives us more information than would otherwise be available about the visual environment. And our brains are doing this all the time, kind of under the hood. We don't really, we're not really aware of it, but it's a fundamental part of how we experience the world around us. So this notion of predictive coding has been applied to psychedelics and the treatment of mental health disorders by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston. Their theory is called relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. Beliefs here you can think of as priors. It's the, the previous information that people are bringing to their representations. And the theory is that the psychedelics systematically reduce the brain's dependence or the, the influence of these priors in experience. And in the context of mental health disorders, priors are not things like where the light is coming from. They're more sort of self-narratives or the stories that people tell about themselves. So you can imagine someone with depression, they, their identity as a person becomes very connected to the depression. And so much so that the way they see themselves as a depressed person makes them less likely, less motivated to go out and accomplish whatever it is they want to do in the world, and then that worsens the depression. And so in this case, the priors are maladaptive. The priors are, I'm a depressed person, I'm never gonna be able to, to do what I want in, in the world. Um, and so the idea is that psychedelics relax 
those priors. And in the context of the right therapeutic environment, new priors can be built that are healthier and more adaptive. So that's the basis of the theory. It's currently really hard to test this theory in the brain because we know so little about how the brain represents things like self-narratives and, and the one's uh, experience of their own identity. And so what we plan to do with the BCSP is to take the conceptual heart of this theory and move it, test it in a part of the brain that we understand relatively well, which is visual perception and the visual system in the brain. So we're taking this notion that psychedelics reduce the strength of predictions in experience, and we're designing experiments in the visual system to see if we can uh, test that theory and then also learn more about the brain mechanisms. So basically we're looking at whether psychedelic, how psychedelics affect the interactions between predictions and sensory information in how the brain creates and uh, modifies its representations of the environment. And we're using a uh, set of phenomena from vision science called bistable perceptions. These are stimuli that are ambiguous that can be experienced in one of two different ways. So I'll show you an example of this. So most of you are probably experiencing this as four red line segments moving up and down, relatively independent of each other. They're not interacting in, in any obvious way. But those exact same red line segments if they're presented with these blue stripes, produce a very different perception. And so now these four line segments, they're still the same line segments, they're moving up and down in the same way, but we are grouping them into a shape and we're perceiving that shape as moving back and forth behind some sort of occluder that's between us and the shape. And so this is an example of predictive processing. We are using all of the experience we've had about you know, animals moving through a forest and disappearing behind trees and then reappearing, or a person running behind a picket fence. There's, it's very often that we are seeing only parts of an image that are occluded by something in the environment. And our brains are really good at sort of taking the little bits of the image that make it to our eyes and then sewing them together perceptually so that we can accurately perceive what the object actually is. And once you see the one on the right, you know, if you look at the one on the left, you may actually be able to perceive that as the diamond moving horizontally as opposed to the four line segments moving up and down. Uh, for those of you who don't experience it, there, there are ways of adjusting the stimuli so that people can actually go back and forth between two perceptual interpretations. Even though the stimulus is not being altered, they're either perceiving it as these four elements or as a grouped diamond. The grouped diamond reflects these this predictive processing, and the four elements predict more sort of raw sensory information. And so the idea from the Rebus theory is that people will be more likely to experience the elemental aspect of this instead of the grouped. And so we can measure that in real time. We can have people respond. Now I'm seeing the diamond, now I'm seeing the four elements. Uh, we can administer psilocybin and see if that alters their perception. And then we, this is all going on within a magnetic resonance uh, imaging scanner where we're recording brain activity in real time as people are either interpreting the stimulus one way or another. So the um, value of this kind of experimental design is that the stimuli are constant, they don't change, but people's perceptual interpretation changes in a way that they can report in real time and then we can track the associated brain activity and see how psychedelics influence that. Another set of experiments involve brain mapping at a very high level. This is in collaboration with Jack Gallant, uh, uh, psychology and neuroscience professor here at UC Berkeley. And so I know you can't read all of these, but uh, these are images uh, derived from human brains, uh, humans participating in this experiment. And the brain is covered by the cerebral cortex. And these uh, representations here are a flattened, unfolded representation of the cerebral cortex. And using the kinds of methods that have been pioneered in Jack Allen's lab, you can record from thousands of locations in the brain simultaneously and determine what features of the environment they are representing and how that changes over time. So all of these colors and all these axes up here are different elements of, in this case, they were listening to uh, stories, so auditory stimuli to the brain, and then different semantic aspects of the stories are represented in different parts of the brain. And so in the visual domain, you can think about, well, uh, features such as color or motion or shape or textures or patterns. Um, all of these are represented in different parts of the brain. And so it enables us to have a very systematic sort of dictionary of visual feature representation in the brain and then ask how psychedelics influence that. So that tells us about the actions of psychedelics and it also tells us about the basic organization of the brain when it comes to representing these visual features. 
Uh, moving on to uh, these studies that are more about the longer term effects of the psychedelic experience. Here we're focused on cognition, emotion, uh, functions of the immune system, and stress regulation, um, as well as some perceptual measures. This is in collaboration with Decker Keltner in psychology and Bill Jagist in public health and neuroscience. Uh, so here we're making baseline measurements before a psychedelic is administered, so days before. And then people have a powerful psychedelic experience, and then we're measuring them using brain imaging and psychophysiology and these various uh, behavioral cognitive measures at different time points afterwards. And so we're asking, how do people <clears throat> change for days to weeks after the psychedelic experience? <clears throat> and uh, Bill Jagus' lab in particular has been studying uh, uh, older subjects in other kinds of studies for a long time. And so it's really intriguing that some of the reported effects of the psychedelic experience are uh, on cognition and emotion and various biological measures are actually in the exact opposite direction of the way those same measures change as people get older. And this is just healthy aging, it's not disease. And so the idea is that psychedelics maybe uh, could reverse some of these, but also that they give us insights again into the basic mechanisms of aging. If, if aging uh, changes cognition in a particular way and the psychedelic experience just changes the opposite way, that gives us a lever to be able to understand basic mechanisms. So we'll be enrolling older participants in this study as well. And Decker Kellner's expertise is in emotion science, and some of you may know his work on awe, A-W-E, and how awe is uh, this transformative experience that leads to all sorts of improvements in, in health and well-being. And so his, uh, he's really interested in what are the exact elements of the psychedelic experience, what, what the, are the emotional experiences that people have that best predict positive long-term outcomes. And one possibility is that one of the things psychedelics do is reliably elicit a state of awe in people. And then awe is then has all these powerful beneficial effects later on. And so he's got really sophisticated tools for measuring different kinds of emotions based on people's reports and also uh, based on um, recordings. And he will test the idea that awe is the sort of mediator of the psychedelic experience to be able to elicit these long-term effects on health and well-being. Finally, there's animal research that's happening in the BCSP. It's directed by Andrea Gomez and her team. And she's quite interested in the cellular and synaptic and, and molecular bases for how psychedelics enhance neuroplasticity. Uh, in particular, she's got a, a focus on RNA splicing. So RNA is the intermediary between the DNA, the genes, and the proteins that cells express. And uh, she's studying how psychedelics influence different uh, configurations of RNA molecules and neurons. She's also looking at structural changes in synapses, as well as recording electrical signals directly from neurons, uh, and looking at how psychedelics influence that as well. So that's the initial research. Uh, we certainly, there are a number of, of labs at Berkeley that are uh, interested in incorporating psychedelics into their research programs, and so we anticipate this part of the BCSP will, will grow substantially in the coming years. Another program, uh, flagship program for our center is uh, it's called the training program. It's this, the BCSP certificate program in psychedelic facilitation. So it's understood that the environment in which people's psychedelic experiences take place is an extremely powerful uh, modulator of their experience and then also what, what the long lasting consequences of that experience are. So it's quite different to, to have a psychedelic experience in the forest compared to a rave, compared to a ceremonial context, compared to a clinical trial for treating a mental health disorder. Um, and it's understood that uh, there's great benefit uh, and also it's much safer to have a psychedelic experience in the presence of an experienced facilitator who is helping to prepare you for the psychedelic experience, is, undergoing, is, is there when you have the psychedelic experience and then is involved in the integration afterwards. And so almost all the clinical trials you've heard about involve trained therapists who are undergoing uh, preparation and therapy during the session and integration afterwards. And so. If any of these psychedelics are approved as medicines, it's anticipated there'll be a great need for trained psychedelics therapists. Um, our program is not really medically oriented. It's not training people to administer mental health treatments. Rather, it's focused more on uh, religious and spiritual care professionals, although there are health professionals as well. We have psychiatrists and, and nurses and social workers and so forth also. And so it focuses on immersive experiential learning. It's a relatively small group. Uh, and it's an intensive uh, program of study for people who are relatively advanced in their fields. The idea being that they will be sort of seeds who can take their, their learnings from this program and then go back to their communities, their professional communities that they've established, 
um, and then share the knowledge there. And so our, our cohorts include chaplains and ministers as well as, uh, as people with more of a healthcare background. The, we intend over time to be able to link the training program to our research program by enabling students in the program to participate in the research studies and have legal psychedelic experiences that way because one of the uh, challenges now is you, you, if you go to a program that is training you to be a psychedelic facilitator, there actually is no way for you to have a psychedelic experience in a legal context. And so that seems like a, a major limitation in the training. And so we hope to be able to address that by having these legal research studies that are available to the, the participants of our training program. And then Professor Tina Trujillo is the director of this program. She's also conducting research studies. They include evaluation of the training program to over time find out which aspects are most effective and then to share this knowledge with the world to be able to inform other training programs to, to be able to dis disseminate the findings. And then also ethnographic uh, studies of the participants in the program as well as the staff. Another major, major focus of the BCSP is public education and journalism. And here Michael Pollan and David Presti are two of the key figures. So even though we live in the age of the internet and there's information everywhere, uh, it it's still can be challenging for people, especially people who uh, are relatively new to the field of psychedelics, to be able to get reliable information. And there's been a lot of misinformation and disinformation over the years as well. And so most of the sources you would go to on the internet to learn about psychedelics have some sort of strong agenda that has to do with how uh, the use of psychedelics, whether they should be legalized or not legalized and so forth. And so we see as a public university feeling a real need here of objective public education on really all aspects of psychedelics. So anyone who is curious about psychedelics or maybe investigating the, for themselves or for someone else, they can learn about current research. They can learn about risks and ways to mitigate those risks. They can learn about the legal and political aspects. Uh, as well as cultural aspects. And so our website is a major source of information here, psychedelics.berkeley.edu. And then we also over time want to establish a forum for gathering, convening people to have conversations, which again, we will always disseminate publicly uh, to be able to guide the field and to, to have uh, evidence-based uh, discussions about the, the, very, the many complex aspects of psychedelics. So one way that we uh, realize this public education ambition is through our newsletter, The Microdose. So this is free for everyone. It's, it's published twice a week. Uh, it involves interviews with important people in the field and also involves a summary of news and, and research developments. And so I encourage you to subscribe to that if you're interested. I, you can do that through our, our website, psychedelics.berkeley.edu. Uh, thank you, thanks to Tim Ferriss. We also have a journalism fellowship program, so here, Journalists uh, make a proposal for an investigative piece, and if they're selected, they receive support from this program to be able to carry this out. And so some of our fellows have already signed book deals based on the, the work that, that the BCSP supported. There's been articles in Rolling Stone, National Geographic, uh, and it's very difficult these days for journalists to have support to be able to actually do deep investigative journalism. And so this is one way that's helpful there. These are all professional journalists who have other kinds of projects. Uh, but the support from this fellowship program enables them to do uh, you know, much more comprehensive coverage of a, of a topic that they might otherwise not be able to, uh, and then they are able to publish it in, in whatever medium uh, they're, they're, they select or that is accepting of their work. We're also doing some po uh, public polling research, and this is uh, headed by Imran Khan, who's the executive director of the BCSP. So there's a lot of really important policy decisions that are being made at the city, state, and federal level. And there's very little information actually about what people know about psychedelics, what they believe about psychedelics. Most of the work that's out there are these internet surveys where there's this huge self-selection bias where only certain kinds of people decide they wanna participate in a study like that. And so we're collecting information from across the United States uh, from all registered voters. So the methodology is very similar to the polls that are used to give information about uh, political elections, for example. And uh, we're testing a variety of questions about people's awareness, knowledge, and beliefs about psychedelics. And again, we're, you know, we're not taking a position of advocacy here. We're just providing objective information for society to be able to use to guide policy decisions and further research. And so we just completed our first inaugural survey and the results are available to anybody. 
uh, part of what this is going to do is establish a baseline so we can actually study trends over time. So we have a snapshot right now of what people's beliefs and awareness and knowledge is in 2023, uh, but obviously things are changing rapidly and there's a lot of kind of reconfiguration of how psychedelics are viewed by people in different contexts. And so we're providing this public service of gathering this information, analyzing it, and then disseminating it. We also have a, an online uh, open education course called Psychedelics in the Mind. The lead instructor is David Presti. Uh, we've teamed up with Nicole Vanola, who's an Emmy Award uh, winning producer. This is also a course that's freely available to everyone. Uh, there, there's a link at the bottom. You can also find it through our center's website. Uh, David is doing some kind of more didactic lectures, but he's also interviewing uh, a variety of different experts in, in different aspects of the field. And this is very broad coverage and includes neuroscience, chemistry, medicine, history, culture, and policy, and uh, really is not making very many assumptions about the sort of previous knowledge that people are bringing to this. It's really for anybody who's curious about learning more about psychedelics can sign up for this course. It is free if, if people want a certificate of completion. There's also a paid verified track that people can do, and then there's quizzes and feedback and additional information that results in them having a certificate having successfully completed the course. So that's a kind of whirlwind tour of our various programs and activities. I wanna say a little bit also about some of the core values of our center. So uh, we believe very deeply in, in the uh, open science and in general, the, the public availability of knowledge and discoveries that we make in the center. And so we've signed this statement on open science and open praxis with psychedelics. And some of the elements of this uh, statement are that we will place the common good above the private gain of the individuals or of the center we will share the results of our research with the public and we won't look to commercialize products and discoveries that are created through our work. And so this has been a foundational principle from the, the founding of the center and is really very much at the heart of what we do. We also have a strong commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and reciprocity. And we are committed to doing that in, in whatever way we can in our different activities. This includes assembling a diverse team within our center. Uh, it includes attempting to diversify the participants in our training program, our psychedelic uh, certificate facilitation program, but also the participants in our research studies. And this has been a big problem in the field. The, most of the participants in these research studies have not been very diverse so far. Uh, in the training program curriculum, we look to honor and integrate indigenous traditions and knowledge whenever possible. And then also in our public education offices, we center indigenous voices. And so partly in support of this, the BCSP, so uh, most of our support, really all of our support comes from philanthropy. Some of those gifts are unrestricted, meaning that the donor is, is essentially trusting the center to make decisions about how best to spend that. Other gifts are for particular, targeted for particular programs. And so for, of those unrestricted gifts, we've committed to allocating 10% of those gifts to DEI and reciprocity initiatives. And one concrete outcome of this has been uh, the establishment of the Indigenous Research Student Fellowship Program. So this supports Berkeley undergraduates and graduates, either from historically, from historically marginalized communities and or whose work addresses reciprocity and, issue, and equity in psychedelic spaces. And this is our inaugural class of Indigenous Research Student Fellows in the VCSP. Uh, so all of these students submitted a research proposal. Some are undergraduates, some are graduate students. They were evaluated by a group of VCSP members, uh, and these are the ones that were selected for uh, being fellows and being supported through these DEI funds. Going on to the topic of funding, as I mentioned, at the moment, all of our work is coming from individual philanthropists, or in some cases, foundations. The BCSP, is, its identity is really not separable from the identity of UC Berkeley as a public university. We believe profoundly in the mission of a public university and public education and committing to working for the public good instead of private benefit. Um, and so partly what that means is that we, we've actually been approached by some corporations about partnerships um, and just couldn't, couldn't get to a point where we felt there was sufficient alignment between the BCSP and some of these potential corporate partners. So at the moment, we don't have any corporate funding. We're not categorically opposed to it, but really at the moment, we rely completely on philanthropy from individuals and, and, um, and foundations. We look forward to a time when the US federal government will support at least the biological research in this area. So for example, the National Institutes of Health, they support a lot of research in mental health treatments for different, uh, at all levels, in animal research, molecular, human research. 
Uh, there's been very little support from the federal government of psychedelics research in, in large part probably because of the stigma, the historical stigma of these drugs. But it seems as though certain aspects of the, the National Institutes of Health are becoming more open to considering support of this. And so that's a potential source of support for our center going forward. But at the moment, there are very few studies nationwide that are, are being supported by the federal government. So almost all of the work is either being done by companies or by uh, through philanthropy. So if any of you are inspired to uh, make a donation or know someone who is to uh, support our work, you can go to our website and uh, the, the URL is here at the bottom, psychedelics.berkeley.edu. Uh, and uh, we have great ambitions, but of course our ambitions are you know, limited by the resources that we have. And so that's a major focus of our center is fundraising to be able to support the work we do. And we, uh, we always welcome people who are, can partner with us that way. Finally, a little bit about plans for the future. Uh, so we have a couple new projects that are, uh, we have the funding secured and we're in the planning and preparation stages. This includes a podcast that will be produced by the BCSP, as well as uh, something that's similar to the journalism fellowship program I told you about, but instead of print journalism, it would be video projects, video uh, journalism fellowships. Both of these are supported by Blake Mykoski. We are looking to expand our activities into the social sciences and humanities. There's a lot of really terrific work that could be done in this area, and I would, it's also been uh, neglected in part for the same reasons that I mentioned how the, the, the research into human subjects has been um, suppressed uh, because of political and, and social factors. We want to continue to build on our existing strengths uh, in these areas, journalism, neuroscience, psychology, molecular cell biology. And we want to expand our ability to, make, to convene uh, people, individuals, organizations to provide uh, public discourse about a lot of these uh, really important questions in the field about you know, what should the certification be for someone to be a psychedelic facilitator, for example or what are the consequences of different kinds of psychedelic mental health treatment. Uh, we have a, a, a lecture coming up later this month on the economics of psychedelic assisted therapy for healthcare compared to some of the existing treatments, for example. And so we're really at the beginning of this, but we, we look to be a place where using the, the good name of UC Berkeley, uh, there can be a lot of attention brought to convenings and conversations that we uh, organize uh, on our campus through the BCSP. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and Go Bears! <laughs>
for many uh, conditions, including autism, I, I think the field is just doesn't have information one way or the other to, to guide at this point, unfortunately. Yes, hello? Okay, um, with um, some of the research, you show the results like for instance with, with through MRI or imaging, is that correct? Yes. Do they do further, um, um, do they show further on like a few months later or years later that those changes were, were maintained? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so I should say we're, we are uh, just at the very end of obtaining all the regulatory approvals to do this work ourselves. And so we have not yet enrolled our first participant. We're hoping to do that in the coming months. So, uh, but some of the, the work that I've referred to by, by other groups around the world uh, for the most part, they've not done long-term follow-ups, and the long-term follow-ups that have been done are, are typically more looking at, for example, you know, is the reduction in the PTSD severity something that's maintained over time? And so there's only a couple examples I can think of where people have made these, these detailed neurobiological measurements and then tracked those over time, but that's something that we're quite interested in doing, and we and, and many other groups as well. But again, the field is just hasn't evolved far enough to really have much information to provide there. Uh, thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, so if the mechanisms of the psychedelics affecting um, the brain are to reset the priors, I wonder what the kind of uh, risks are of uh, the experience, psychedelic experience, perhaps if it's not kind of guided as, as, so there could be some reprogramming happening, perhaps a loss of security in you know, what the world is. And I wonder whether this means that there will have to be repeated experience. And with, with that, you know, what are the costs, long-term costs in, ter in terms of the health of the individual? And another question I have is, um, so are the networks of auditory and visual perception the same as uh, self-perception? Thank you. Um... So the first question is, if, if you do reduce your priors, do they necessarily get rebuilt in a way that's healthy and adaptive? Maybe not. And I should start by saying that the Rebus theory is a theory. It needs to be experimentally tested. Uh, but to the extent that psychedelics in general uh, enable you to uh, experience significant changes in yourself, uh, those can go in, in many different directions. And so that's part of why people think it's so important to have a trusted and, and reliable guide or facilitator for these experiences. And that, you know, maybe the rebuilding of the priors is actually not something that happens very much during the psychedelic experience, but happens during the integration period for days, weeks, months afterwards. And so that might be actually the most uh, precarious time in a way, uh, in terms of what the long-term outcomes are. But there's no guarantee that if, if, if priors are reduced, that the, the subsequent priors are going to be beneficial. Uh, and so I think it's something that needs to be attended to very carefully. Uh, so that's, and, and, but it's understood also that people are having all kinds of psychedelic experiences. They don't necessarily have support of a trained guide or facilitator. And so those are real risks that people need to know about is that these can elicit really substantial changes in one's sense of self, sense of the universe, uh, relations, and, um, and that uh, one needs to be very mindful and respectful of that. Um, sorry, your second question. Was, oh, about the commonalities between sensory systems and, and self-narrative systems. You know, there, there are motifs in the brain in terms of patterns of connectivity and neural cell types and so forth. Uh, but then there are also really important distinctions between the, the, the nature of information processing in different parts of the brain. And so it's somewhere in between. There are, there are some important similarities. There are some critical differences. And that's something that's going to come out of this research is really characterizing them much more completely. Uh, I had a question about, I guess, sort of, beginning to break the boundaries of the conversation because to get it to a government federal level of it, it has to first, I guess, go through like social approval. And I think at least a majority of society doesn't really approve of psychedelics. Like talking with my friends and our experiences with our parents, the thought of even bringing up psychedelics to our parents is insane. Like they would think they raised us wrong or something. But from personal experience of psychedelic use and all of my friends who have had tried psychedelics, like it's something we would love to talk with our parents about. We think they could really gain some insight from trying it. But it's how do you even begin the conversation to someone who's already preset their mind that 
it's been so stigmatized for if psychedelics is bad it's you know it's like cocaine or something they see it on that level yeah uh there's so many ways to answer that question i think first of all this is just one um finding from our polling research surprisingly of of the people who participate in the study uh, more than half are su supportive of, of regulated therapeutic use of psychedelics. So there's different types of legalization, right? One would be it's treated more like a prescription medicine, where it's not freely available for everyone, but in the right context with a, a medical uh, doctor prescribing it, it could be available in that way. And that may be happening fairly soon. The, the data from MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD uh, is compelling, and probably in the coming months there will be an application to the FDA to have it approved as a medicine. And so at that point, you've got the FDA saying this is a viable medicine and can be prescribed, and you have the DEA saying it has no known medical use. Um, probably there will have to be some sort of reconciliation there, and that could involve rescheduling the drug. That wouldn't make it necessarily legal for anybody to use. It would be still be regulated and uh, in, in very particular contexts. Um, I think in terms of starting the conversation, I, I feel like a, a huge part of how this field has shifted is actually Michael Pollan and his writings and his Netflix series and a lot of people who had certain preconceptions and in some cases based on misinformation um, saw his what he had to share and his experiences and, and it, it definitely shifted the conversation in many ways. Um, I'll also say uh, a lot of the interest in mental health treatments and psychedelics uh, is coming from uh, the community of, of veterans in the military where there's such awful mental health uh, struggles that so many veterans have with very limited treatment options. And so uh, there are a lot of people who are really uh, advocating for psychedelic assisted therapy for that population. Um, they don't necessarily have a you know, fondness for the 60s and the counterculture and hippies and things like that. It's just this is a new way of reducing suffering for this group of people. And so we have some very conservative politicians who have been great proponents of research and treatment development for psychedelics. Um, that is really sort of separate. It's a completely different sort of uh, entry into psychedelics than the kind of narrative of the, how things have uh, happened in, in U.S. popular culture. So uh, that's an intriguing and, uh, um, aspect of this sort of more, this resurgence of, of interest in psychedelics. Yes. Thank you for your research. Um, my question is, how has psychedelics eased anxiety related to end-of-life diagnosis? Um, so that, some of the earliest studies were exactly on that, actually. So initially, people who actually had a terminal diagnosis uh, and the psychedelic treatment was not addressing the terminal disease, but rather the psychological, emotional aspects of confronting one's mortality and the anxiety that often comes up for people there. Uh, and so the data, I, I think, are quite compelling that uh, that type of psychedelics intervention, if you will, uh, is very helpful for people being able to manage their anxiety around the end-of-life diagnosis. Um, and so there, there are multiple uh, published studies on ex exactly that question. So that's actually further along than even some of the, the mental health disorders, the sort of diagnosable mental health disorders. We've got five minutes left, so we'll take two or three questions, and then I think uh, Professor Silver is ready to uh, in, uh, engage individually with folks for a few minutes afterwards. Hi. Um, so the 2021, uh, the Nature paper um, about MDMA and PTSD, um, from what I understood, they were doing like a very specific kind of trauma-informed therapy. Uh, um, to deal with PTSD, um, but like ruminations and the, the sort of theory you were talking about, there's a whole school of you know, trauma-informed therapy that believes that, you know, most of those ruminations come from unresolved trauma, mostly in youth. And so what I'm wondering is if your certificate program, like of training people, um, if, you know, because the risk of like not having a trauma-informed facilitator um, could be either like kind of a bad trip or like bypassing trauma in like a Jerusalem syndrome kind of outcome. So I'm wondering if your certificate program is like building on the trauma-informed facilitation. Thank you. So I'll start by saying I'm a, a neuroscientist and not a therapist and, and not an expert on, on various types of therapy. Um, certainly the trauma and its consequences are a component of the program. Um, and you're right that this study was on people who had a 
severe PTSD diagnosis. And so trauma was kind of front and center there. And I'm sure that for these patients, the preparation and the integration was the, 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 the unresolved trauma was a, an enormous part of that. Um, our facilitation program is not designed specifically for training people to, uh, to treat mental health conditions. Certainly it, it could be useful there, but because there are chaplains and ministers and, and uh, other religious and spiritual care professionals, we anticipate that there will be various opportunities for people to have psychedelics services with support outside of a, a mental health context. And we already see some states that are uh, passing laws that enable people to access those services, even though these drugs remain illegal at the federal level. Um, and so there are other programs that are much more focused on training therapists for working with patients. Um, and our, our program is distinct that way. It, it's, more, it's more general and it's more sort of fundamental principles and that puts a lot of emphasis on being culturally informed and uh, ancestral knowledge from, from various uh, places around the world. It's, and so it's different than uh, one that's kind of grounded first and foremost in a Western medical perspective. Um, I just, this is kind of an altered states question, but I wonder, just re referring to the question about the danger of our priors being maybe replaced in a bad way by these experiences, is there any part of the research that is asking if, um, if what happens in these experiences are not just neurological constructs, but maybe um, actually letting us perceive the previously imperceptible elements of the real world? Uh, and are you referring to elements of the real world that are, they have a physical identity, but we, we're, we normally are, are unable to perceive them? Uh, I mean, th there are definitely people who, uh, I would say, are open to that kind of explanation, and then there are others who are more materialist and physicalist, and they're just, you know, everything is happening in the brain, and it's all about changes in synapses and so forth. So uh, I would say for the people doing the neuroscience work in our center, most of us are starting with the assumption that this has a neural basis and we're trying to find that neural basis. Um, but I think any scientist in the field has to acknowledge that we know so little about the nature of consciousness and human experience that we want to be careful about closing doors off prematurely, but our, we're, 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 we have the tools that we have that enable us to study the brain uh, in a very sophisticated way. And so that's the sort of construct of our experimental design that we're working with. Hi, I'm um, curious how you assess and think about the significance of psychedelic experiences, because it seems like uh, the relationship between a spiritual importance of birth of a child and a psychedelic experience with a chemical is somewhat akin to the experience of an intimate interpersonal relationship and masturbation. Sorry, what was the last word you said? Masturbation. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, th these are all surveys, uh, and they were designed uh, by the researchers to try to convert this ineffable, powerful subjective experience into numbers that can be analyzed on a spreadsheet. And so they're basically asking people to literally to try to sort of rank various elements of the experience uh, compared to other powerful life experiences they've had. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's all just self-report survey data. And I think, you know, somewhat surprising just that, that this, for a lot of these people, uh, the psychedelic experience was that powerful and transcendent and spiritual meaningful. That, I'm not sure that addressed your question though. Um, they may well. Uh, wh whether they would rank that as, uh, you know, one of the top five powerful experiences of their lives. Um, is... Fair enough. If, if I may, it might have something to do with the idea of preparation, someone being with you and someone helping you integrate afterwards, being different from someone's experience with psychedelics at a rave or other contexts where there doesn't seem to be any um, reported longer term transformational impact on people from using these compounds in that kind of way. Um, that wraps up our formal presentation for today. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us for this great presentation. Please join me in thanking Michael for his presentation.
as, as I mentioned, uh, he's volunteered to spend a few extra minutes if uh, people have further questions. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for staying in touch with your alma mater or your children's alma mater. Um, Cal couldn't live and survive and be as marvelous for the next generation uh, without your time and attention and caring and engagement. So thank you very, very much. And again, psychedelics.berkeley.edu if you'd like more information after today's session. Thank you. Thank you.